Good evening, everyone. Um, I would like to call this meeting to order, but before I do, I want a couple. We want to make a couple comments. One, if you heard the chatter a few minutes ago, it's because uh, uh, Dr. Narini ran our executive session meetings. And uh, for the record, I heard he did a great job. Yay. Uh, I, I was unavailable. The uh, one thing caveat I'd like to give everyone is I'm having very tenuous technolo uh, technology connections today. And in the event that something occurs and I go offline, either Dr. Narini will step in or I will call in and we will manage through this. But I wanted to give you all a heads up that if there's any issue, it's not uh, because I don't want to be with you. It's because technology has taken over my life for a minute. Uh, so with that, it's now 631 and I'd like to call to order the February 23, 2021 board meeting of the Maricopa County Community College District Governing Board. I want to remind everyone that we are live captioned for our meetings. So please look in the chat window of our WebEx meeting where you will find a link. Please click on that link to open a web page with the live captioning if you so choose. Um, at this time, I'm going to call roll of board members uh, for the record. I'd like to see if Ms. Munoz is on with us this evening. Hello, Ms. Bittersmith, are you present? Thought I heard you a minute ago. Okay. Marie, did you call like, for, for, for Bittersmith? Because yeah. I am here. Okay, perfect. You're just a little Great. garbled. I am. Uh, darn. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. apologizing ahead of time. Is that better? We're still but, garbled. Yeah. No, at least for me, it's, it's fine. And I'm still here. Okay, perfect. Great. Mrs. Graff. I don't oh. see her on. Okay, uh, Dr. Narini. I'm here. Uh, Ms. Smith. Present. Thank you, Dr. Thor. Okay, did I see Dr. Thor on here? I'm, there. She I'm sorry. She's on. Okay, Dr. Thor, are you there? I can't hear you if you are. Can anyone else hear her? No. Is she on I show her not connected on my. Um, oh, there she is. Okay, Dr. Thor, are you with us again? Well, um, IT may want to check with her because I see that notice that she's going in and out. Uh, Miss Wynn? I'm present. Thank you. Uh, with the president, uh, without acknowledgement from Mrs. McGrath or Dr. Four, the list participant list on my computer does show uh, Ms. Dr. Thor present, so there must could be a technology issue there as well. But uh, given where we are, I think I'm going to proceed into the agenda with general pieces and then. Could uh, anyone notify me if either Mrs. McGrath or Dr. Thor join us so we can make that note for the record? Okay. Um, thank you. How's that? Mm -hmm. So with that, um, we're going to move. Hello. Okay. Still some challenges there then. Okay, so we're going to move into the agenda and I this point, um, I'm going to uh, note that there are no substitutions for the evening, and we now have the faculty executive council report. Ms. Nango. Good evening, President Sullivan, governing members, Chancellor Gonzalez, members of CEC, colleagues, and guests. As president of the Faculty Association, it is my pri privilege and pleasure to share with you all some of the things that faculty do outside the classroom to help students successfully complete their ed education. 
Tonight, I'd like to introduce Dr. Barry Vaughn, president of the Maricopa College's Faculty Foundation Board. He is here to share the amazing work of the foundation on behalf of our students. Dr. Vaughn. Thank you, Ms. Nango, uh, Madam President, governing board members, uh, CEC members, guests. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to share a little bit of the work of the Maricopa College's Faculty Foundation. Uh, I am Dr. Barry Vaughn from Mesa Community College, Professor of Philosophy and Religious Studies, uh, and I currently serve also as the president of the Faculty Foundation. Uh, I'd also like to introduce the other board members of the foundation. They're probably not with us tonight, but just wanted to let you know about the other board members uh, who assist in this work. Halise Agria is our vice president. Dr. Jim Simpson is our treasurer. Dr. Jose Aguinaga is our secretary. Uh, Yvette Espinoza, Dr. John Griffith, and Dr. Camille Descalia are our other board members. The Faculty Foundation uh, was founded in 2007 by the then Faculty Association President uh, Janice Riley, who was also a counselor at Mesa Community College. And one of the things that she noted in her role as a counselor is that many of the students that she would see coming through her office were falling into financial uh, uh, gaps in the system. They had small financial needs that oftentimes uh, escaped the uh, larger programs of student financial aid that were available at the time. And she had the idea of establishing a foundation that could focus its work specifically aiming at supporting those students who are most vulnerable, who had small unforeseen financial hardships that would otherwise cause them to drop out of, uh, out of school. And so uh, we got together in 2007 and uh, founded the Maricopa College's Faculty Foundation as the charitable arm of the Faculty Association. I was one of those founding board members and in 2015, uh, became the president of the foundation. Our work primarily focuses on providing emergency grants for students who have a small financial need that would be sufficient to cause them to drop out of school. As we all know, the student population that we serve is one of the most economically challenged student populations in the state. And oftentimes a very small unforeseen need can be sufficient to cause a student to drop out a loss of textbooks because their backpack was stolen or their car breaks down and they can't make it to class. The loss of a roommate in some cases, uh, obviously domestic violence and issues that cause someone to have to seek immediate temporary housing. There are a host of small needs that arise during the semester that traditional financial aid isn't really aimed at helping to supplement. And so the work of the foundation is in providing small emergency grants. And the way our, our program works is if a faculty member has a student that comes to them and says, hey, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to drop out because whatever the small need is, that faculty member sends an email to one of the members of our board with the student's name, their ID number, and a brief description of the situation. We then uh, meet as a board via email to discuss that need. And usually within 24 to 48 hours, we can cut a check and get it in the student's hands. The goal being to keep them from dropping out because we know if they drop out, they're very, very unlikely to ever come back to us. So our emergency grants, that are up to $500. We, we do make uh, exceptions on occasions, but our standard grant uh, goes up to about $500. These grants are one-time grants designed to keep students attending class. We don't want them to have to worry about dropping out because they lost their books or their car broke down or whatever. If it's a need, a need that we can meet, we wanna be there to get that need met as quickly as possible. And as I said, usually within 24 to 48 hours, we can actually get funds to the students to get that worry off of their mind so that they can stay in school. And that's really the key. Um, generally, we give uh, we give away uh, about $7,000 per semester plus some summer funds. So around $14,000 in emergency grants 
are made every semester. But of course, during COVID, uh, that has increased. Uh, last spring, we doubled uh, the amount of funds available uh, last spring. And at our regular board meeting last Friday, we just again doubled the amount. So we'll be giving away uh, up to 14,000 uh, in the spring semester. We'd almost exhausted uh, our spring allotment of funds. Uh, and the board felt like in these crisis times, we needed to dig a little bit deeper uh, and, uh, and and see if we can't uh, meet those needs continuing through uh, the rest of the semester. Our philosophy is very, very simple. A Maricopa student in need is a Maricopa student that is worthy of assistance. And as long as we have funds, we're gonna provide those funds to help support our students. It is truly, I've, I've served in many, many different aspects of, uh, uh, of faculty governance and uh, working on committees uh, in and out uh, of uh, all aspects of, of governance, both at the college level and at the district level for my career starting in 1996. And I have to tell you, my work on the faculty foundation board is the most rewarding work that I have ever done in service to Maricopa. And I know that my other board members feel exactly the same way. It is absolutely a thrill to make sure that our students that come to us with an emergency need can stay in school and finish the semester. I thank you for your time and the opportunity to present the great work that we're doing on the Maricopa College's Faculty Foundation Board. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Vaughn, and uh, certainly we and our students appreciate the, the work of the foundation. Uh, commendable. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the adjunct faculty association report. I want to remind everyone that that report has been submitted in writing and uh, Ms. Train does or Dr. Train does not require any speaking time at on the agenda this evening. Moving on to the interim employee Senate report. Uh, Ms. Mange and Ms. Chandler, uh, your turn. Thank you, President Sullivan, members of the board. Chancellor Gonzalez, CEC colleagues and guests. My name is Shannon Manji. I'm an administrative specialist senior at Paradise Valley Community College in the Academic Affairs Division. I'm here alongside my colleague, Anna Chandler, who is the coordinator for the ACE program at Scottsdale Community College. We are here before you as the co-chairs of the Interim Employee Senate, and we are providing the following update. Next slide, please. We would like to start off by saying welcome to a few new faces we are going to see at the district office. We would like to first give a shout out to Dr. Eric Lashinsky and welcoming, welcoming him in his new role as interim provost. The employee Senate had a great supportive and collaborative relationship with our previous provost and her team. And we look forward to continuing that relationship with Dr. Lashinsky and his team. We want to give congratulations to Brian Spicker as he was offered the permanent president and CEO position of the Maricopa Community Colleges Foundation. We look forward to collaborating with Brian and the foundation to promote student access and success. We want to give congratulations to Eddie Jenna on his new assignment at district. He has been a big supporter of all staff across the system and we look forward to collaborating with him and his team on his future work. And a big shout out and welcome to all the staff and faculty who have recently joined Maricopa Community Colleges. Let's continue to work towards making 2021 great. Next slide, please. Our Senate continuity team has been working very, very hard on our future elections and we wanted to briefly go over this timeline. Starting March 1st through April 23rd, we'll start accepting self nominations for those who want to dedicate time and hard work to the future of the employee Senate and to staff across the system. March 2nd and 3rd, we'll be hosting town halls for all staff across the district to talk about how important it is for employee representation as well as have Q and A sessions for all staff. May 3rd through the 5th, we'll be hosting elections in a virtual and digital environment. What you'll be seeing throughout this time as well is our many communication campaigns, which will include emails, updated information on our website, and a roadshow from Anna, myself, and our colleagues in the Senate 
to make sure that we get the word out about how everyone's voice is important and anyone is available to participate in the Senate. Next slide, please. We want to continue to share with you all how faculty, HR, and the Senate are collaborating for the betterment of Maricopa. We would like to give a shout out to the fact team and faculty leadership. You know recently that they had informational sessions regarding um, charters for their divisions throughout the system that came up within the fact documentation that the fact team put together. Anna and I reached out to Patrice, Sasha, and the fact team to allow employee Senate representatives to attend those sessions and see what we could learn and possibly apply to the employee Senate documentation. They welcomed us, no hesitation. Our employee Senate representatives attended and we learned a lot. We thank them very much for allowing us to attend those sessions and opening them up to us. We also want to thank all our residential and adjunct faculty for their support of staff during this time. And we want to say thank you to you who, who all, excuse me, who all have been on campus teaching during this semester. You are setting precedents for us to continue to possibly open during summer and fall. And we thank you for all your hard work that you have done for our students, as well as supporting our staff. Anna, next slide, please. Thank you, Shannon. Um, for employee wellness, some staff have been successfully starting to get vaccinated as we look to return to work plans. Um, but we do find that many are struggling to get the time slots um, needed in order for everyone to come back to campus safely. Um, we will continue to be persistent and continue to support employees as they look to get their vaccines and ensure that we do have a safe and cautious return to work. Um, we also wanted to continue to support and acknowledge our employees who continue to work diligently to keep us running at home while working with technology issues, as well as those keeping the campuses safe and ready for return. Uh, many of our staff and especially IT department have been working to make sure everyone has um, a seamless transition as well, not just for staff, but our students and working towards their student success. So we thank you so much for being extremely important to everyone's um, ability to do what they're doing from home. As our campuses continue to support our communities for COVID testing and now a vaccine site, um, we do thank those campuses and community and staff that are supporting or helping um, has provided Maricopa a great opportunity to show our students as some nursing programs are helping with the vaccine, um, giving, giving out the vaccine at certain campuses. And um, last but not least, just continued campus support. Obviously, our students are still in need of food and resources from us. And so those employees that are going to campus and making sure food drives are happening and opening pantries for our students and getting hotspots and computers and technology, we thank you so much for uh, being so committed to student success and helping us um, keep students engaged on our campuses from home. Next slide, please. We wanted to take a moment to thank the chancellor for embracing and supporting uh, Maricopa Community College's constituency groups. Um, he sent out an email on January 21st that brought awareness to all of the constituency groups. As we know, he's also meeting with each to find out what is needed within Maricopa to support um, and gain employee engagement within these constituency groups and just make sure that we're all participating to support diversity, equity, inclusion, and engagement. Um, many of our interim employee Senate members are a part of these constituency groups, so we are very proud and happy that we're able to serve in so many capacities to make sure communication and transparency is happening across the district. Uh, just another piece of information, we do want to thank those who are a part of constituency groups um, as there are annual dues and, and um, that do go to student scholarships and support our students in the long run. And so I know that really helps us when we're looking to assist students and especially in the information given prior by faculty um, that these, these little funds will go a long way for students to make sure that they have the support they need. Next slide, please. And lastly, with our Mercer study, um, we're happy to announce that we had over a thousand employees attend the open house sessions. We're very thankful to Mercer and HR for providing those open houses and providing transparency and communication as we look to understand Mercer and work together to make a better Maricopa when it comes to um, this study. 
Uh, employees continue to state their concern and Mercer is helping to identify what is missing and what the gaps are and continuing to be very open with us in, in getting this work done and doing it correctly. Uh, and so we're very, very thankful to HR um, for that opportunity and communication. And, I, and we see a positive moving forward with Mercer um, with this kind of communication plan. And that is all from the Senate. Thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Um, thank you. And there is a lot of appreciation in your report this evening. So thank you for that. Uh, moving on then to our student life reports, uh, that would be from Mesa, uh, let's see, we'd like to welcome a straight mountain community college student ambassador, Lillian Goodsell. Please go for, go Good ahead. Evening. Oh, oh, sorry. No, go um, ahead. Good evening, President Sullivan, members of the board, Chancellor Gonzalez, CEC, and distinguished guests. My name is Lillian Goodsell. I am a student ambassador with the Office of Student Life and Leadership at Estrella Mountain Community College. I am happy to be here and give you a campus update on EMCC and share the resources that we offer. The office, uh, could you click on the next slide, please? Thank you. The Office of Student Life and Leadership provides an environment which fosters the social, academic, and professional growth and development of the student. Student Life and Leadership is housed in the EMCC Student Union. Could you click the next slide, please? Thank you. So, student Life services include the Student Food Pantry, which provides boxes of food for students twice a week, filled with non-perishable food items. Monthly EMCC also partners with the St. Mary's Food Bank to host a mobile food pantry events to help families in need. These services serve our community safely during the hardships brought by the pandemic. Since fall, we have served over 2,000 family members through the St. Mary's Mobile Food Pantry. We also have the Student Clothing Boutique or Alliance Exchange. Students can visit the boutique two times a month and receive up to four free items of clothing each visit. This is an excellent resource for students to use if they have a class presentation or a job interview coming up. They can come to the Lions Exchange and receive free professional clothing for these occasions. The Lions Exchange also offers a variety of personal hygiene items, which are available to students to take for free. We also offer financial child care assistance, discounted bus passes, campus tours, and leadership development. Would you click the next slide, please? Thank you. Currently, EMCC has over 30 clubs and organizations. Some of the many clubs include DECA slash Entrepreneur Club, Social Work Club, Drama Club, Student Nursing Association, and I was a member of the Gaming Club, and I'm currently working on getting into PTK. Can you click the next slide, please? These are the clubs, as I mentioned before. We have a lot of them. Next slide, please. And now for some programs and events. Some of our past events include our Heritage Month events, Hispanic Heritage Month, Native American Heritage Month, Black History Month, the holiday, we also did the Holiday Angel Drive for children in need of gifts. We serve, the drive served 23 families and 68 children. We also uh, do coffee talks, which provide an opportunity for students to engage in dialogue with EMCC administration. Some of our upcoming events, as part of the Black History Month programming, we will be hosting a Black Business Forum on the 25th. Our other events include Women's History Month and the St. Mary's slash EMCC Mobile Food Pantry. Could you click up the next slide, please? Thank you. <clears throat> Since the pandemic, Student Life has developed virtual resources and educational pages for students for fall 2020 and spring 2021. We have hosted a virtual Welcome Week resource page. Our Welcome Week page features COVID-19 updates, welcome videos, the EMCC President and Deans of Student Affairs link, links to the campus resources, tips for success and online learning, basic needs and emergency assistance, the EMCC virtual bookstore, virtual tutoring services, and online library resources. 
The resource page also featured informational videos from clubs and organizations, virtual events, and provided fitness and wellness information. Would you please click the link if you're able to? This is our page, as you can see, there is a lot of interesting information on here. Okay, thank you. And um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Another example was the Voter Education Week page. The page featured important voting dates and deadlines, the country, uh, county election calendar, dashboard access, various videos on how to vote by mail, how votes are tabulated, how to track your vote, information on the Electoral College, women's suffrage in the 19th Amendment, the Voting Rights Act of 1964, and documentation for COVID safety measures needed the day of voting. Each day of the week had a different theme. Would you click the link, please? As you can see, there is plenty of great information and resources all about voting. Next slide, please. And finally, athletics. With the pandemic not allowing students to meet in person, we had to come up with a better way to support our student athletes. So we created a student athlete canvas course. The Canvas course consists of three modules, student success, athletic eligibility, resources, and resources and services. The student success module contains information on SMART goals, success strategies, and classroom etiquette. Resources and services covers the different campus departments for students to utilize to be successful. At the end of each module, there's a quiz that a student athlete must pass. Another method of providing support to our student athletes virtually is the creation of the student athlete update form. It must be submitted once every week and is submitted directly to the athletics director. On the form, student athletes provide classroom progress reports for each class, as well as reports specific to athletics, as well as any issues or updates that are happening off campus with the student athlete that may impact their student experience. The form is used as a method for the athletic director to stay in contact with the student on a weekly basis. The men's and women's golf teams kicked off their season last week at the Mesa Inventational, and they look forward to competing in a full golf season. Thank you very much for your time. This concludes the Student Life Report uh, for Australia Mountain Community College. Thank you. Lots of activity out there. I appreciate your uh, in keeping us informed. Thank you. Um, moving on, there are no student Senate reports this evening, nor are there any emeritus awards or recognition. Uh, so with that, in moving to the chancellor report, uh, I'm going to note at this time that there are going to be video files in this presentation. And um, before I do that, I do want to acknowledge uh, one thing. That is, both Mrs. McGrath and Dr. Thor have joined us as board members, which changes our count from 50 to 70. And Ms. Munoz, our student advisory trustee, has also joined our call. So uh, thank you for, for being with us. And now there's a full complement of board members present. But going back to the chancellor report, I want to note that uh, the volume is controlled by you, as all is the size of the video. So options for these are in the bottom right of the video. Anyone who called in directly with their phone, however, will not be able to hear the audio. You will be able to watch and hear the video once it is posted to our YouTube page, and we're hoping that's relatively soon. 
So with that, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, it's your report. Thank you, um, President Sullivan, members of the board, CEC, and guests that are with us. Um, I appreciate Lillian's energy and enthusiasm uh, in a previous presentation. I wish that I could bottle and bottle that up and sell it to folks. We'd, we'd make millions. So good job, Lillian. Appreciate your energy and the enthusiasm that you bring to that. Um, President Sullivan, before I, I get into the uh, presentation uh, portion of this that you'll hear from affinity groups, I would like to provide the, the board with a very quick legislative update. Um, you've, continued, you've continued to receive these weekly as a part of the uh, weekly snapshots that I send to the board. Um, but since last Friday, um, House Bill 2523, which is the baccalaureate degree authority at community colleges, um, has officially passed the House as of yesterday. The vote was 57 ayes to three nays. And then, of course, this uh, moves over to the Senate, and we're going to continue to focus on working with our Senate uh, legislators. Our legislation to increase the statutory lease to purchase capacity, which is Senate Bill 1012, officially passed through the House and the Senate and is on the way to the governor's desk for his signature. This legislation should take effect in late summer or early fall, depending on when the legislature adjourns. We want to thank um, bill sponsor Senator J.D. Mesnard and Representative Shauna Bullock for their support. Um, I'll continue to provide these uh, updates to you in a snapshot and weekly tracking spreadsheets for the latest, but I wanted to make sure that you had these two big updates that have transpired this week. Um, over the next... Over the next few uh, board meetings, um, I want to introduce you to groups of employees um, that, uh, that that do work above and beyond the call of duty and participate in what we call affinity groups. Affinity groups are opportunities for employees to engage uh, with groups that they are either um, actually members of or support or interested in their work. And so there's, there's no exclusion uh, area opportunity here. Anybody can be a part of any of the groups that you're going to hear from and learn more about. Like our students who are actively engaged um, in, on and around our campuses uh, beyond the classroom, um, we see a tremendous amount of retention. We see a tremendous amount of this feeling of a sense that they belong and have the opportunity to make the organization better. And that increases their experiences and we see uh, great outcomes from our students when they engage in that way. We find that with our employees, when they can find an opportunity to engage and get plugged into the organization outside of their typical work experience, um, we see a greater return and investment on their time and energy into the organization as well. They tend to be a happier employee. Um, they tend to feel that they are, are, are a greater part of um, solving some of the problems that our organization faces. So I wanted you to, as a board, to, to meet these individuals. Um, you're going to hear from two affinity groups tonight. At the next governing board meeting, you'll hear from two more. And then in our April board meeting, you'll hear from the last two. And so I'm, I'm proud to introduce uh, the first group, which is the Maricopa Veterans Education Task Force. Again, these are employees that have come together uh, to work on a cause that they believe in and are passionate about, and they want to ensure that employees that can um, be a part of this group and uh, its its work resonates with them as an opportunity to be engaged in, the, in advancing the organization. And it's also um, groups that focus on helping students that identify with these groups as well. So with that, I will turn it over to the MVET um, group, which is the Maricopa Veterans Education Task Force. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Gonzalez. Uh, President Sullivan, members of the Governing Board, Chancellor Gonzalez, CEC, faculty, staff, and guests. My name is Kelvin Duvall. I am president of the Maricopa Veterans Education Task Force, better known as MVET. Next slide. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Chancellor Gonzalez for this opportunity to talk about MVET in tonight's Governing Board's meeting. Uh, our mission is really to advocate, educate, and serve Maricopa veteran employees, students, and families of both. Uh, we want to ensure that all Maricopa veteran employees uh, feel comfortable, respected, and that their voice matters uh, within Maricopa um, and in many different facets. So that, that is what we do. Right, next slide. 
Uh, and here's a, a quick video that was put together. This is the MVETS executive team leadership. Okay, if you guys could just give me a minute to load up the video, please. Hello, my name is Kelvin DeBall. I am the president of MVET. I was in the United States Navy, where I was an operations specialist, and I was stationed on the USS Calpins. That's an Aegis cruiser. I worked in the Combat Information Center, where I operated radars and military information leaks. I ran for president of MVET about three and a half years ago, and I did so because I wanted to be a part of MVET and really take more of an active role assisting in its mission, bringing veteran communities together and helping Maricopa veteran employees. It's often easier to go to a veteran when you do need assistance for anything. MVET is important. Not only does it bring Maricopa employees together that are veterans and veteran allies, but it also bridges the gap to the student veteran populations and the local veteran communities. Uh, we help with convocation. Uh, we engage in nonprofit veteran organizations throughout the valley. And we really do uh, provide a bridge where we all can come together and help one another and strengthen the community within Maricopa. Hi, I'm Michael Wainscott and I'm the Vice President for MVETS. Now, prior to my time in Maricopa Community Colleges, I served with the United States Marine Corps. I was stationed with 3-5, uh, which are 3rd uh, Battalion, 5th Marines out of Camp Pendleton. I was a machine gunner, 0331 all the way. Uh, I love the Marine Corps, uh, and I always knew that I was going to be uh, a, a member or a service member of the United States Marine Corps ever since I was little. I joined MVETS back in 2016 when I first became the manager of veteran services, and uh, it was a combination where I felt on the campus level I could provide that service for our veteran students, veteran independent students, and then at the district level we can kind of wrap around uh, all of our, our veterans and really dependents. We didn't want to turn anybody away. Um, dependent of veterans who wanted to provide a support group or support structure uh, for employees and for our students. Um, I know that we're an employee-based organization, but uh, we have a great group where we talk about what we can do for both our, our fellow employees, um, but also what we can do for our students across the 10 Maricopa campuses. Uh, I think that makes it a lot easier to provide services and resources for our veterans, uh, both in a community-based relationship but then also on the campuses itself. And then it also does a really good job bringing the veteran managers at all 10 Maricopa colleges together. So that way we're always kind of walking and marching to the beat of the same drum. So we're gonna keep doing this. We're gonna keep going strong. We're gonna keep trying to live that Maricopa way uh, by bringing our, our veterans both in the communities, in the schools, as an employee group. We're trying to bring them together and make that a, a much tighter niche so we can create a, uh, a support structure for everybody in need. Hello, my name is Lauren Brock, and I'm the current webmaster and vice president of MVAT. I was a spouse of an active duty airman for four years, and my job was to support and encourage. I work with active duty students, spouses, veterans, and their dependents as the military advisor for Reusable Auto College. I joined MVAT to help my job position and because I enjoy working to collaborate with members who have served and are serving, as well as their families. MVAT was important to me because the mission aligns with my goals to advocate, educate, and serve Maricopa Community College's veteran employees, students, and families of both enriching our community culture and improving success. Hi, my name is Leslie Olson, and I currently serve as the MVET Treasurer. My active duty service was in the United States Navy as a fire control in second class, and my weapons platforms were CWIS and 5-inch 54. And no, CWIS does not stand for Captain Wilson. Um, I thought it was important to uh, join in that because I wanted to be a part of a group that had very similar interests. Um, and I feel that, that we have that as, as being veterans. And it's very important to, to me to be a part of something bigger. Um, I also feel that it's important as an MDET representative that our voices are heard throughout Maricopa. And so that's why I joined. I wanted to represent veterans and not just veterans, veterans dependents too. Dr. Gonzalez, is there more? Uh, yes, President Sullivan, I'm expecting Calvin to come back on. Calvin, uh, are you still there? We go. There we go. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, once again, this is the executive team for MBET. Um, these are very recent photos, as you can tell. Um, 
my beard grows very fast. Next slide. We have over 250 employees in Maricopa that identify as veterans. In fall of 2020, we had over 3,500 students self-identify as veterans that represented 3.7 of Maricopa student population. We have 10 college campus student veteran centers. We have MVET communities of uh, communications uh, that go up to over 658 veteran employees and community partners on a regular basis. Next slide. Through all of our engagement throughout the year, uh, it's not only about the employees, although that is our main focus, but we also work with student veterans and veteran organizations. Uh, we developed a student veteran mentoring program where we have Maricopa employee veterans that go through mentor training and they go through a mentorship with a student veteran for a year. Uh, we have an annual MVET retreat that we uh, had take a, a whole day to do some really uh, deep dives into topics and initiatives that we wanna build upon. Um, we have various events throughout the, the year. In November, we have the Veteran Appreciation Barbecue that we have on various campuses. Uh, we always have our end of year celebration in December um, on the Saturday when Army plays the Navy. That's always a really fun event, a lot of smack talking, which we do enjoy. And during that event, we always give out the annual John McCain Community Engagement Award. Um, Last year, we had to cancel both the appreciation barbecue and the end of the year celebration event, um, but we did start a new MVET challenge, uh, which is um, it, it pits all 10 colleges in the district office, all 11 units um, against each other in a friendly competition, um, something that we're, we're very used to uh, being around in the military. Um, and in, th in this first year, uh, Rio Soto College uh, actually won it, so they were able to have MVETS uh, challenge Victor flag, which is a Jolly Roger, and they're now displaying it in Rio Salado's lobby. And they will for the next year until the next college can take it away from them in our next MVET challenge. And of course, um, at the end of our academic year, we plan for and we run the annual student veteran convocation, which is always the most fun and biggest event we do. Uh, and it's, it's really an event that brings all the veteran communities uh, together. And we also have a lot of community partnerships. Um, with the Mana House. Uh, they do a lot of great work with homeless veterans. Um, there's only Department of Veterans, Luke Air Force Base, Maricopa County Stand Down, um, NATCON. NATCON is the annual Student Veterans Association Conference where over 3,000 students um, come and take part in that. Um, I always chaperone uh, three to four student veterans from Maricopa to that conference on a grant. Um, it's an opportunity for them to really look at their goals um, in their academic lives, in their professional lives, and their personal lives. And there's always hundreds of companies that come to that conference uh, looking to network with student veterans. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a, a great picture of our convocation we had three years ago at uh, PC. Um, we normally have it at PC now because it's just very centralized. Um, next slide. And here are just some, some pictures of some events that we have put on or attended. Um, we, are, we have the benefit of being able to go to um, certain fundraiser events and, and benefits uh, that either Maricopa sends us to or we get invited to um, the upper middle one. We got invited to the Ability360 where we got the opportunity to meet Larry Fitzgerald. Um, and the lower left is our Embed Challenge coin. You can see the Jolly Roger flag in the lower right that real Slotto one in our first MVET challenge. Um, and all these, all these events and all these activities that we, we participate in, uh, it, it really gives us the chance to, as Maricopa employees, um, engage uh, with each other, engage with uh, the community partners that support veterans, and gives us the opportunity to engage with student veterans here within Maricopa. Next slide, please. Uh, so once again, I wanna thank Chancellor Gonzalez for the opportunity to talk about MVET tonight. Um, and if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And thank you. Thank you, Calvin. We appreciate your, your presentation. And, and of course, we also appreciate your service to our country along with the other uh, members of your leadership team. team. Keep, please keep up the good work. Um, at this time, I'd like to introduce a member of the Maricopa Council on Black American Affairs to present on 
uh, their affinity group, also known as MICPA. Thank you, uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Greetings, Interim Chancellor Gonzalez, President Sullivan, Governing Board members, faculty, staff, CEC, students, and community members. Can you hear me okay? We can. Who are you? I'm sorry? Yes, introduce yourself, please. Okay, I didn't know if you heard me initially, so I'm just trying to check. Um, greetings, Chancellor Gonzalez, President Sullivan, Governing Board members, CEC, faculty, staff, students, and community members. My name is Dr. Michelle Traveler, and I am the 2020-2022 Maricopa Council on Black American Affairs, also known as MECPA president, and I am a 27-year veteran of the Maricopa Community Colleges. And again, I would like to thank Dr. Gonzalez for the opportunity to present tonight. Next slide, please. MECPA was created in 1988 through a partnership of the Maricopa Community College's Black Educational Task Force and the National Council on Black American Affairs. Today, MECPA is a chapter of the National Council on Black American Affairs and an affiliate of the American Association of Community Colleges, also known as the AACC. MECPA is dedicated to the interests of administrators, faculty, staff, and students who identify as Black, African, African American, or of African descent. Next slide, please. Pictured here are the members of the MECPA executive body. Uh, we are missing our um, public relations officers uh, on this picture. Um, I've already introduced myself and I'm representing Mesa Community College. Our vice president and president elect is Dr. Debbie Webster representing Phoenix College. The MECPA treasurer is uh, Vashi Worley Moore who also represents Phoenix College and Andrea Banks of the district office. Chase McIntosh, who's not pictured, serves as our public relations officer. Next slide, please. We will now play a short video to allow the MECPA executive body to introduce themselves. Elza, can you please play the video? I sure can. Give me just a minute to get a cute. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michelle Traveler. I have a PhD in information technology. I am currently serving as a computer information systems faculty at Mesa Community College up until May. I am also the president of the Maricopa Council on Black American Affairs, also known as MECPA. I am a 27 year veteran of the Maricopa Community Colleges, as well as a product of the Maricopa Community Colleges, having graduated from South Mountain Community College in 19. 1994. I serve on MECPA as the president um, to reach back, help to support the black employees and students of the organization. Hi, I am Dr. Debbie Webster. I am the vice president of the Maricopa Council on Black American Affairs. I am a psychology professor at Phoenix College and I also serve as department chair for the behavioral science. The reason why I joined this organization is because I am dedicated to the fair practices of teaching and learning for all students. Thank you. Hello, my name is Vishi Rolly Moore. I am the treasurer for the Maricopa Council on Black American Affairs. I'm employed at Phoenix College of Student Life and Leadership as a student service specialist senior. I participate in this constituency group because I believe that it helps to raise awareness of the culture and current events and because it helps to improve increase, encourage, and empower Blacks and African Americans to perform at a higher level of learning and living. Thank you, Elsa. You're welcome. Give me just a minute to jump right back, please. Of course. Hi, uh, this is Marie while Elisa is working on that. Uh, could everyone make sure that you're on mute uh, if we're, unless you're speaking? I know there's a lot of background noise and we'd like to be able to continue without too much disruption. So thank you very much, everyone. And Elsa, back to you. Okay, thank you. Almost there. Are you guys seeing the PowerPoint presentation now? 
No. No. Nothing on the screen. Okay. Okay, now. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you, Elsa. This Sorry, next that. slide. No worries. I, I understand technology very well, so we're 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 fine. Uh, this next slide is a demographic demographic snapshot of the employees who self-identified as Black or African American upon hire, but it does not include the biracial African American staff members like our public relations officer, Mr. Chase McIntosh. So, folks that have self-identified. In terms of our employees, there are 244 full-time employees that have self-identified as Black, 355 part-time employees. For our student population, as of fall 2020, there were 8,948 students who self-identified as Black or African American, which represents 9.2% of the Maricopa student population. Next slide, please. Goals and areas of focus. For staff and student support, we assist the community college staff and students in navigating higher education pathways and achieving success through obtaining employment and education goals, educational goals. For individual worth and collective voice, uh, MECPA believes in the development of full human potential. We encourage lifelong learning for all people and acknowledge the worth of the individual. We also For leadership development, MECPA works to provide MCCD employees and students with access to some of the best leadership development programs, policy analysis, research briefs, and peer-to-peer -peer seminars and meetings, all of which will help you to become more effective campus leaders and allow our employees and students to meet their current obligations. Next slide, please. Over the past 30 years, MECPA has hosted a number of successful student support and employee engagement events. We've hosted a MECPA student convocation for almost 30 years. MECPA has also hosted Black Tie Scholarships, as you can see in the photo here with our former Chancellor, Dr. Glasper, Dr. Muir Harper Marinick attended these events, as well as many of our uh, governing board and CEC members. Also pictured here is the 2017 student convocation. Uh, this event was very well attended. In fact, that was uh, one of the last events I think that we're going to be holding um, in 2018 because uh, we, we've actually outgrown uh, that facility. MECBA has also hosted events with community members and engaged our community members in our, in our, uh, our, uh, our programs. Next slide, please. This is a photo of our 2013 MECPA graduates. We have ma the majority of our CEC members there, governing board president, college presidents. Um, it was kind of hard to get everyone in that picture, but I think we got most of our graduates in there as, as well. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Um, I would like to end by saying that MECPA looks forward to working with the Chancellor and Governing Board on current equity issues related to Black and African American faculty, staff, and students, and more importantly, aligning our institution with our in-state universities and other colleges and universities around the world. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Traveler, for your presentation. And um, I just want to thank everybody for your patience during these presentations. Clearly, we're going to need to find a better way to transition to and from the video um, to keep the momentum going on these presentations. So thank you. The presenters did a fabulous job despite this challenge. And um, President Sullivan, members of the board, that concludes the chancellor's update. Thank you. Um, th thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. And the presentations were very well done, thank you. Uh, appreciate the updates and informing us of all of the activities that are going on around us that make such a difference for our communities. Uh, with that, I'm going to move us on the agenda to Citizens Interim. I'd like to note that this evening there is a report. So uh, I would like to remind everyone that Citizens Interim is an opportunity for members of the public to address the governing board. 
In compliance with the open meeting law, the governing board will neither discuss nor act on issues raised during this portion of the agenda. When necessary, issues will be taken under advisement and placed on subsequent agendas. Presenting concerns to the board and the free expression of ideas should be communicated with decorum and respect and civil or disorderly conduct or presentation is not permitted. The use of derisive or insulting language or the direction of remarks that uh, defame, attack or harass an individual uh, may serve as a, as a cause for the board to uh, direct that the speaker immediately conclude. Well, in these times, we do not have people personally presenting. Instead, they submit a written request. So the one um, I have in front of me, I will read to you this evening. So beginning, uh, greetings, Chancellor Gonzalez, governing board members, friends, and welcome Tom Narini as my new district representative. My name is Ms. Joanne Pleasant. I am a resident and homeowner here in the South Phoenix community for the last 23 years, as well as a former MCCD employee. I attempted to communicate at the previous meeting. However, my message was not received. Today, I appreciate I approach the board with a heavy heart and troubled mind as I stand in disbelief that there appears to still be no oversight regarding the internal operations and functions of the MCCCD EEO and human resources offices when it relates to complaints of discrimination. It was approximately two years ago since I first approached the governing board with great concerns regarding the lack of oversight and accountability in ensuring that transparency between the two functions be identified. Mr. Elliot Hibbs responded prior to his departure that the only way MCCCD responds to issues like this is through lawsuits or to take legal action. Do we no longer search for the truth or are we simply at the point where the truth no longer matters? Well, since I took no legal action and simply relied on the quality assurance processes, I'm sure you have in place now to ensure that your internal processes and procedures are reviewed to ensure equitable treatments to all, including me. Whose truth is it when you file a complaint of discrimination with MCCCDEEO and the complaint is accepted and the investigation underway internally by your EEO director, Derek Hall, after which time the truth is being revealed. Then the district decides to retain an outside attorney, Stacy Gabriel, to defend the illegal action which deprived me of my right to protected activity when I filed my original complaint. Paren C. Stacy successfully defends Maricopa County Community College District in termination appeal. Whose truth is it when you file your district's EEO complaint and it is accepted and then 14 days later you are terminated prior to any type of investigation. Why does the district spend thousands of dollars each year defending the wrongful actions of the district against the rights of the employees? Whose truth is it? Does the governing board provide this oversight? Is there an outside entity that provides this oversight? And um, at that, the letter concludes, and we know that uh, Ms. Pleasant has provided Elsa with her contact information. So uh, in that regard, Dr. Gonzalez, uh, could you please have someone follow up with her uh, regarding her question about oversight, uh, et cetera? I believe you also have a copy of this letter. Yes, we'll do, President. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, Including that section, we now move to consideration of the consent agenda. You will notice that on the uh, agenda as prepared, the paragraph that defines the consent agenda appears at the end of the list of items there. But I do uh, want to remind everyone that as we move to the consideration of the consent agenda, uh, we have several items and all of these items are matters and let consent matters unless they are removed from the agenda at this time. So with that, do any board members or the chancellor wish to remove any items from the consent agenda? I'd like to move, this is uh, Dr. Nerini. I'd like okay. to move to remove number eight of the 
proposed course fees and changes? Okay, my agenda says seven proposed course fee changes fiscal year, or are you looking at eight proposed fiscal year tuition and fees? Uh, yeah, maybe I, my I, the one on the screen is eight proposed course fees and changes to fiscal year 2021 22. Yeah, that's eight on mine. Okay. All right, so you're number eight. All right, thank you. Agenda sent. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. So we're looking at item eight as it appears on the screen. Proposed course fee changes fiscal year 21-22 budget. That's what you're asking to be removed from the consent agenda. Is that correct? Uh, um, yeah, because I, I now I see that number nine, and I think yeah, I think it's the, the court. It's the course fees. Yeah, so it's number eight. Okay, the tuition great. and fees. All right. So um, number eight is at your request is being removed from the consent agenda. Are there any other items to be removed from the consent agenda? Being none, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. And second. that was Ms. That Wynn. Was Thank you. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Is there any? Um, so with that, all those in favor, I'm going to take the, the roll vote. Ms. Bittersmith? Uh, Mrs. McGrath, are you in favor of uh, approving the consent agenda as presented? And um, Aye. Dr. Narini? Aye. Ms. Smith? Aye. Dr. Thor? Aye. Ms. Wynn? Aye. Uh, Ms. Bittersmith? Aye. Can you not hear me? Now I can. Thank you. Um, Sorry. I, vote I am Ms. Munoz. Aye. Thank you. With that, um, the board votes seven zero in favor of supporting the consent agenda with our student trustee also voting in the affirmative. With that, then we'll move to the item number uh, eight, proposed course fee changes fiscal year 2022 budget. Uh, Dr. Narini. Thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank everybody for their quick and, you and need thoughtful a motion. Oh. Yes, I know. That's Dr. Narini, what is your motion? Uh, so my motion is, well, I just have some, some questions on the fees, uh, and, um, since we can't discuss the item, do you have a, until have a motion on the floor to accept or not the item, would you, uh, would like to make the motion to approve the course fee changes? I, I, I would like to move to accept the course fee phase, uh, changes with, uh, um, a condition. If that's appropriate, I think you have to state your position. Okay, I would I would like to uh, approve the the course fees as they as they are in the condition with um, an opportunity to to look at a refund policy to to be put in place uh, for students to request a uh, a policy to to refund mandatory fees. Uh, just a policy in place so that there's a. Um, <laughs> process so they can request a, a course fee refund. Okay, so that's a really long motion. So, okay. um, your motion is to then approve course fees as presented and add a caveat of policy to be developed that supports something. A process to request uh, a refund. I don't. Okay, is there a second so we can have a discussion on that? Uh, Dr. Narini, it doesn't appear I'll, that I'm sorry. I'll, second, I'll, I'll okay. second it for purposes of discussion. Thank you. All Dr. right, Thor. so we have a motion and a second. So now discussion, Dr. Narini. 
OK, well, thank you. Uh, I, I want to thank everybody for the for the quick responses they did to to the questions I had on, on some of the fees. Um, and, uh, you know, because it was I, I just apologize that uh, some of the questions where I was working off of an old um, an old um, um, proposal. Uh, at first, I, I just want to say how excited I am with with uh, the proactiveness of some of the departments in getting the, the tutors in there. Uh, to help the students, you know, make sure that we're we're successful, and they and they we retain uh, the students and make sure their grades are good or, or much better, and and we graduate more students. So the only thing I was I was hoping that we could uh, at some point talk about getting data of how these tutors are working. You know, like what what have the process been? What is the the retention rate and the success rate of the students in these classes before the tutors, uh, and get some quantitative data. Uh, about how the, how we support the students, how these supports have helped the students in their graduation um, or, or their their success in the courses. What? Oh. And, and okay. Any, uh, any questions from board members beyond this? I I have a question, Dr. Narini. Mm -hmm. um, yes. I think that that may be a great idea. Is that appropriate to go in the proposed course fee changes? Um, or could it be a separate plan or program that we do later? Because I I hear what you're saying. It just sounds like it's not. Um, yeah. Fully, no, I agree. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I, so I, I think what we need to do okay, is. One at is a time. Oh, sorry. No, I said one at a time. You you guys oh. are talking over each other. So go ahead. No, go I, ahead. I, I think that's something that we need to consider in the future. Uh, as we propose these these, these fees for for tutors, we're we're asking students to pay for tutors, uh, and I just would like to see the the quantitative, uh, the qualitative data for or the quantitative data for for the results because I, I'm sure that I, I'm sure that having tutors in the in the classroom is going to show that we have more success. Uh, the students are going to graduate more often. They're going to be more uh, successful in classes. So I think sometimes we move forward, uh, we we do that. Um, but what, what I was what, what I'm trying to get to is some of the fees that I'm that I'm looking at, um, like for example the the clinical my my clinical exchange um, fee. I noticed that that uh, we're we're, at, we're asking the students to pay for a, a forty dollar fee for um, for the it's called my clinical exchange and it's a forty dollar fee pays for a year long. Uh, uh, subscription to that to that service, but we're asking them to pay for that for a class that they're taking uh, one semester and then the following semester we're asking them to pay for that same fee again. And so I'm thinking the second time the students are paying for that fee, if we have a way for them to request a refund for that fee uh, because they've already paid for their subscription, they have that subscription for the whole year. Or another example was uh, another class, I think it was the AT something 100 class where we're asking them to to pay $10 for a book. Uh, if they've taken that class before and, and dropped it before uh, they finished, or if they had uh, a friend or a sibling taking that class who wants to loan them the book or give them the book, uh, is there a way that we can ask, that student can ask for a refund for that mandatory that mandatory fee? Um, and yes, so it, it's it's some of those ways that that you know, we're asking students to pay for things that they may already have. Or they may not need, or uh, I think Ms. McGrath brought up the the question uh, uh, last week when we talked about the the theater class where they're paying for uh, a certificate. If if there was a process, I'm not I'm not opposed to you know requiring the students to pay the fee, but is there a way for the students to request a refund? Right now, I don't think there's we have any any policy on the books that talks about how a student can ask for a refund for a fee. There's there's a policy to get a refund for a course if they drop the course or they, they can't finish the course, but there's not a policy that I can find that says a student has a, a, a process to request a refund on a fee for a specific course, if that makes any sense. Uh, Dr. Neri, I think you're making sense. Uh, what I might suggest is that um, we take a vote on your motion, see where we are, what we can do if it passes. Of course, there is no policy that's in the motion. I mean, in the course fee right now, so that might. Create some awkwardness uh, to make a statement about policy being it, but there isn't one that we can review as part of that. If the motion doesn't pass, 
then we could uh, pass the course fees and make a deliberate intention to ask for a policy to be prepared and presented to the board that would address the issue of course fee appeal process. That sounds um, like what we, what we need to do. Yeah. Okay, so what um, we're so if unless there's discussion, Miss Miss yes, Sullivan, Thor, it, yes, it, sounds, it sounds to me like Dr. Narini may be prepared to withdraw uh, his motion. Yes, and, <laughs> and make a new motion with there appearing to be consensus from the board that the administration look at his proposal. Well, because when, when I was through the policy process. Yes, because yes. All right, so uh, thank you, Dr. Thor. So, Dr. Amy, do you want to make the new motion? Or Dr. I, Thor, would you like to make the motion? I'm happy with to withdraw the motion I that I made, so. Okay, so the, the motion has been withdrawn. I it's would no like to make to speak to this. Yes, Mrs. McGrath, under discussion still. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that really bothers me is that every presentation we've had tonight has talked about how all we have all of these students that cannot afford food and how that we are providing food through the pantries, through the food banks, et cetera. They go on and on about it. And yet we mandate in several of our classes that they have to buy a uniform shirt or a polo shirt with the logo of the school on it. And to me, that just makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. The reason for the uniform shirts is so they can be used to wearing a uniform shirt when they go to work in a place that a uniform is required. It just makes no sense. And I would like to make certain that we have a policy that students can request a refund or not have to pay the fee. And I'm strongly in favor of the first motion that uh, Dr. Narini made. And if that won't, doesn't pass, I'll vote on the second one, but uh, we need some common sense in the way we treat our students. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mrs. McGrath. So I think that is consistent with uh, what I'm hearing as a consensus of the board and where you might stand on uh, the withdrawal of the motion. Dr. Narini, would you like to, uh, so I, unless I hear differently, I understand that you are withdrawing the motion that is on the table around the course fees plus policy that doesn't exist at this point. And with that, we'll take that off the table. And now we need a motion to approve the proposed course fee changes and introduce an idea of creating a policy for mandatory review or review of course fees appeal process. Um, so is does someone motion? want to take up? So go ahead. Take is, make is the motion. I, it's up to, to you and or, uh, so, so proceed or, uh, if Dr. Thor would like to offer that as well, whatever, whomever would like to. I'll accept go any ahead. help I can get. <laughs> okay. Go. I, I, I'd like to propose that we accept the fees. Uh, and as well as um, develop a uh, have the administration develop a policy for students to request uh, refunds for mandatory fees. Oh. Help. And uh, Doctor, uh, so is there a second on that? I There's second. No second. We can... Okay. We Well, everyone's cutting out. Sorry, President Sullivan, are, are you speaking? If if so, it's, it's cutting in and out. Okay. So I 
Rosa, can you hear me? Yes, I can, sir. If we could just have whoever's not currently speaking to mute their microphones, please. Thank you. Ms. Sullivan? Ms. Sullivan, are you there? Okay, I think she may have been disconnected. Yes, yeah, so I, while President Sullivan addresses that technology issue she's facing, I believe Dr. Narini is going to need to step in and continue the meeting. Yes. Uh, Dr. Narini? Yep. So, okay, if uh, Ms. Dr. Thor, if you can help me with the uh, rephrase that motion yes, and what we'll be I, voting on? Uh, before I help you rephrase that motion, um, I would like to ask either uh, legal counsel or the appropriate administrator, whether or not we are causing any problem uh, in an action to approve course fees by adding on a request that a policy be developed. Thank you. This is Melissa Flores. I just wanted to chime in and say that there, I, I think that it is appropriate for you to, to um, discuss whether a policy does need to be developed regarding um, a request for um, a return of fees. I don't think there's a problem with, with the board asking that. Can, can, can I ask, can we just uh, go ahead and approve the, the course fees as they are and then put on the next month's agenda maybe uh, a discussion on developing the policy, would that be more appropriate? Uh, Dr. Narini, this is, um, this is Linda Thor again. Uh, perhaps the chancellor can confirm that he has heard the uh, interest of the board in seeing that a policy for either fee waiver or fee refund be brought forward and thus perhaps avoid having to delay by putting this on another agenda. Perfect. Dr. Thor, be before that happened though, yeah. before that happened, Mr. Narini made a new motion and Ms. Ms. McGrath seconded it. So again, he would have to withdraw the new motion in order for us to do that for parliamentary procedure. But I'm fine with- yes, you are, you I, I believe that is correct, yes. Okay. In, in that case, so, I'll withdraw this motion as well. This time, can we just take a minute, Ms. Sullivan, are you back in? Ms. Sullivan? Okay, I'm sorry, Dr. Narini. Um, can you proceed? I'm so sorry. Sure. So I'll withdraw that motion as as long as um, Dr. Gonzalez has, has heard the the request of the of the board. Yes, I have, Dr. Narini. Okay. So then we'll uh, so we'll vote on the motion as it stands in the. Dr. Narini. Yes. I do not re withdraw my second. Okay. Uh, so do we proceed with the, with the vote then? Yes, according to Roberts. Okay. We need to get a book on Roberts and have everybody read it and follow it. That's true. Okay. So is there any more discussion before we vote on the motion that as it, uh, uh, Dr. Thorpe, you can help me rephrase that or restate that? Uh, well, I, I think what Mrs. McGrath seconded was your original motion to approve, approve the course fees as presented and request the administration to bring forward a policy that allows for course fee refunds or waivers. Okay. So that is the motion. Uh, so we'll, 
go through. Uh, any more discussion? So we'll go through the uh, roll call. Uh, Ms. Bittersmith? Aye. Uh, Ms. McGrath? Aye. Uh, Dr. Thor? Aye. Uh, Ms. Wynn? No. Uh, Ms. Sullivan, are you back yet? You forgot Jacqueline Smith. Oh, Jacqueline Smith? Sorry. Aye, thank you. And Ms. Sullivan, is she back yet? I don't see that she's back yet. We're working on her. And you need to vote, Mr. Marine. And I'll vote aye. Uh, do we need to wait for Ms. Sullivan? You want to ask for the student advisory oh, vote? Yes, the student advisory vote. Thank you. Ms. Munoz? No worries. I vote aye. Ms. Sullivan, I think I can hear you. Hello? There you are. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I, I entered during a vote, so um, I'm feeling a little awkward to either say aye or nay. So, so we're, we're is this a motion? Okay, go ahead. The, the motion is that we accept the fees uh, as they are with the administration coming up with a policy or procedure on on uh, refund requests or waivers for fees. Okay, um, I'll vote aye in support of the motion. Okay, so that's 6-1 uh, in favor, so the motion carries. Thank you. Yeah. And I'll turn it back to you. Oh, gee, okay. I um, I apologize, everyone. So uh, please accept my apologies for having to step away. All right, I'm on now uh, the call, and we're moving to the agenda to other action items. And what we have is the second reading and approval of 2021-22 faculty administration collaboration agreement, effective July 1, 21. Uh, with that, um, do I have a, uh, I want to remind everyone we've had several workshops on this topic. We've also been presented with readings and have had opportunities to do Q and A. This is our uh, last opportunity, unless there's a motion on the floor right now to approve and we could move to discussion. Ms. Sullivan, I yes, move Dr. the Sorry. approval I move the approval of the 2021-2022 faculty mm -hmm. agreement. And I'll second. Thank you. Um, I'm getting a note that I'm in audible or, or going in and out. Is that true for all of you? I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. I can Thank as well. You. We well, can hear you. <laughs> okay. I just received a few texts saying I was being garbled. What's that? It's been moved and seconded, and now I'll move. Okay, now you're coming in and out. Okay. Shall I proceed? Ms. Sullivan? Sullivan. Dr. Narini, would you please sure the meeting? So the uh, the motion's been uh, made by Dr. Thor, and I seconded it. Uh, Dr. Narini seconded. Uh, is there discussion? Yes, definitely. Doc From and, what and I Dr. can Marini, gather, I have we have had a different uh, uh, set of rules presented each month. Each time we have one of these, there's more things added to it. And I'm wondering if we've had the entire uh, present agreement presented each month. For instance, the agreement that I received said it was a draft. And I'm wondering uh, why we don't have the entire one presented for three months. Okay. It, it, it's, if I understand it, it's a draft until it's been approved. Is that correct? Uh, Dr. Narini? Yes. 
this is Greg Peterson, uh, President Chandler Gilbert, uh, representing the, the faculty administration collaboration team. If it's helpful, I can respond to the question. Thank you, please. Uh, Dr. Rini, um, uh, Mrs. McGrath, the, um, we, we did provide, so the documents you received, the, um, are the same documents that we provided in um, October. So the October, you know, it's the documents that are presented on the, um, the agenda item um, on the screen, the, the 2020 uh, 1001 faculty agreement final, that was the final draft that we presented in October that has not changed. That includes all of the comments. The, the 2021 um, 0202 fact final agreement final version is the same document just removing all of those comments. So it's, it's a clean version of what would then be published. Um, so those are the same documents. The only changes uh, from those two documents are minor changes that are reflected in that additional changes addendum, which is the third document there. So um, they are the same document. Um, they just, one is a clean version without the comments. The other one is the same that was uh, provided last October with the comments. Thank you. So, so yeah, the one in the board book is the complete, the complete final draft then, correct? Correct. Okay. Any, any more discussion? Questions, comments? Okay, uh, we'll go to the vote. Uh, Ms. Bittersmith. Bittersmith? Let me unmute her. Hold on just a second. There. Okay, Ms. Bittersmith? I actually have a series of questions oh, okay. um, that okay. I wanted to ask. And you could not hear me asking that, <laughs> that oh. list. So, uh, so I apologize for that. Um, if you would bear with me, and I have sat through the uh, work sessions before I was on the board, and of course the discussions, and worked my way through the red line and the other documents. I, and I, I, with the board's indulgence, I have just a series of questions, several of which I know the answer to, I believe, but I, for the benefit of the public and for all of us, I want to just make sure that we are we're clear on the record as what's happening with this agreement, because I know it's been a mountain of work for the fact team that has been working through this. So with the indulgence, I would just like to validate that um, the sabbatical uh, for the sabbatical rules, um, and as are in page 61 of the final clean version, uh, are applicable only for residential faculty. It's my understanding that's the case. I just want to make sure that, that that's clear. And I don't know if you can answer these questions. I guess I'm going to turn maybe to Ms. Flores, because uh, the rest of my questions are sort of related to the opinion she provided the board per Mrs. McGrath's questions. But if, if there are others that can respond to me, that would be fine. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Narini, uh, Ms. Bearsmith, this is again Greg Peterson um, uh, representing the facts. So I'll answer what I can um, and then we'll um, uh, gladly uh, 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 turn over uh, to uh, the floor to um, uh, Ms. Flores as well. The, um, so quickly looking at the um, the section as you mentioned on sabbatical. Um, so pulling that up, uh, you are accurate. So I pulled that um, the the language specifically in um, twelve uh, article twelve point eight um, right. states that the it, uh, leave may be granted for residential faculty only. And and that's consistent with the previous agreement, as I understand it. Uh, correct. Okay. Um, if I could continue, I'm, I just want to clarify so that I understand uh, and the public understands the policy for reassigned time, which I'm finding in section 7.33. Uh, again, as I understand that the uh, ability to um, utilize reassigned time for other functions that are on campus are again, only applicable to residential faculty. Is that correct? Uh, uh, that is correct. Okay. And who is who is the decider and supervisor of that reassigned time function? I, I'm reading it. It looks like ultimately it's in the role of the college president, but it, is it also with the department director's jurisdiction? So, um, Dr. E, uh, Ms. Bittersmith, the um, the uh, uh, reassignment is um, is a management right. 
Um, so it would fall within the purview of the president um, or designee. Um, and um, or as outlined um, in the agreement, um, as determined um, by the administration, um, working with the residential faculty. Okay, thank you. And I just I want to clarify, it talks about the college president, but it looks like there was a designee. Um, if I could move quickly on, under the, um, as I'm again looking at the faculty agreement, there's lots of conversation about um, how this came about and that the task force that was composed is not only members of the faculty association, but others that may not be members have been part of this, this process. Uh, and this is really related to a question that I think Mrs. McGrath posed uh, to our council who's responded. I, again, as I understand it, the faculty association is not a mandatory requirement. You're not required to belong to that, correct? Uh, that is correct. And our representation um, on, uh, on fact um, uh, reflects that. So not all members of our residential faculty representatives are members of FEC or the Faculty Association. Sure. Okay. Uh, but but everyone um, operates, member or not, under this agreement if it's passed, correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, and the reason I'm asking that question is because it leads into a question that was that was posed to Ms. Flores about whether or not this agreement is a um, a, a CBA, a collective bargaining agreement, and and how that relates to that. I am familiar, but not an expert in some relatively recent case law regarding City of Phoenix and um, Phoenix Law Enforcement Association. Can anyone just tell me, respond to that litigation? Of the, is there any parallel at all that is applicable to the faculty association status with the community college district? Um, and is there, uh, the, would the issues that were raised about, please arrange with the City of Phoenix have applied all to this agreement with the community college district. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Neen, Ms. Bitter Smith, where I can start, um, uh, this, um, I know this concern was raised in the summer of 2019 um, by the governing board. And so uh, at that time, um, Ms. Uh, Samantha Blevins uh, was representing the Office of General Counsel um, and met with FACT over multiple meetings to ensure that our language was in compliance with state regulation um, in response to that. So um, kind of setting the stage, um, uh, there, there was um, a, a concerted effort um, in that work. Um, I, I don't know, I'm gonna ask real quick if there's anyone, uh, any other fact members who would like to share something um, before asking uh, Ms. Flores um, to uh, opine as well. Thank you. Um, Greg, I'll jump in. Um, Dr. Narini and board members, uh, this is Stacy Smith. I'm residential faculty at Paradise Valley Community College um, and a member of FACT. And um, just to, to add on to uh, what Dr. Peterson said, uh, the, the recent regulation and the, the case law that came through, um, how the how Maricopa does uh, reassign time, which is different than what is actually in the the case law, which is considered release time. There is a difference there, um, is appropriate uh, because of the work that is done and the reassigned time that is given. So um, there's no issue with that as far as how this agreement has been uh, written. And this is Melissa Flores. I just wanted to. Um, jump in and say that the language in the uh, recent case law, um, I think it's really helpful to explain why the the way that we do reassign time here doesn't um, isn't going to run afoul of any you know of any legal um, position is that the um, consideration that's given it has to be so inequitable and unreasonable that it amounts to an abuse of discretion. And the release time, the reassigned time that we do here is, is not um, unreasonable. It's not inequitable. It's actually, um, I, I would say that it's, that we're actually getting more of a benefit um, than the, than from the, the, from the position or from the people who are on this reassigned time than um, actually giving in terms of consideration. So I, I don't, I think that it is very dis it's distinct from what was in the recent case. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Ms. Thorson. 
I, I have one final question. I'm saying thank goodness. Um, Article 25 talks about a pro the process to review and revise this agreement. And I honestly don't recall much conversation ab about this process. If I read it, it looks like there is an annual review by the FACT team and then um, potential of a four year review with the board. Can someone just quickly tell me, because I, I don't see a mandatory review process, I'm making the presumption that because it requires board approval, the board could bring it back at any point if they felt compelled to to revisit that. But I, I want to clarify how that works, because that's a, a very, looks at least from the red line version, a fairly significant change from what's in the previous agreement. If, if I'm wrong about that, please correct me as well. Uh, uh, Dr. Nerini, Ms. Bittersmith, um, no, the, um, the, the process is set up that um, it would be an annual process to review um, articles um, within the faculty agreement that uh, the fact would review the entire document every four years. Um, and then at the discretion of the governing board, that uh, this could be brought at any time to the governing board. Uh, again, um, FACT's role is to make recommendations. Um, and all recommendations, um, any changes uh, or modifications would come to the governing board for review Thank and you. approval. Thank you. I appreciate it. I just want to make sure I was clear because that's one I was not, I was not clear on. Uh, other than clearly at the end of the day, the board is the entity that approves this document. Thank you all. I appreciate the indulgence of other board members for these questions. I appreciate the opportunity, Dr. Green. You're welcome. Uh, it looks like Ms. Sullivan is back, uh, so I'll turn it back over to her if, and she can carry on. Can I, can I ask a question? Mrs. Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, because <laughs> I'm not hearing Mrs. Sullivan. Um, so um, this is for the attorney, I think it's Melissa Flores. Um, I. Could you give us a real life example of the reassigned time? I appreciate the fact that it's not that we're getting a benefit and all that, but could you give me what that looks like with a real person who's serving and gets reassigned time and why you don't believe it's a violation similar to what Phoenix PD just went through? I, I appreciate your opinion. I just want to know if, if I could hear it like in, in a real life case. Yes, absolutely. In fact, I'm going to lean on um, President Peterson to give me a, to give an example of the way we do the reassign time here at Maricopa, and then I will, after he gives that example, I'll explain why I don't believe that it that it will run afoul of the law. Thank you. Uh, so, Dr. Narini, um, Ms. Wynn, the uh, uh, I'll give a couple quick examples. Uh, one example would be. Um, uh, providing um, reassigned time for a faculty member to oversee the development of our program maps um, for uh, our guided pathways work. Um, and so that was um, uh, bringing together faculty, establishing the maps that clearly outline the sequence of courses and supports for students across our new fields of interest in order to um, expedite students' ability to move through those pathways, either into transfer or to completion. Um, that would that would be one example. Um, a second example would be um, participation of faculty on um, the faculty administration collaboration team, um, as um, outlined uh, by the governing board's resolution um, of having three representatives uh, from the faculty association. Okay. Thank so you, Dr. Peterson. So, I'm sorry. Did you have another question before I? Well, I just, the first one seems to me to be like you, you have a special project and so you're pulling someone who may be a math teacher off and they're going to work on that special project, which is what I heard. And the second one was specifically for the FEC and that, that and that's where I think that that's where this got, that's where I think that they had an issue the last time. So I, I and I believe that we, got an general's opinion the last time. So I am just, I didn't know the law had changed since the last time we got an opinion. So I'm, so Melissa, please proceed and tell me why, why my misperception is incorrect or my perception okay. is incorrect. So in both of those examples, the, the standard that we're looking for is we're looking to see if there, if the, the inequity with respect to the release time or the reassign time 
is um, so unreasonable that it would amount to an abuse of discretion. That's what the that's what the law is going to look at to determine whether there is a violation of the gifts clause in the Arizona Constitution. So, in both of those examples, the benefit that the district is getting, the benefit that um, that that is being um, given to the organization and the and the um, the the running of and the development of curriculum, the running of the district and the development of curriculum is not inequitable. It actually is is um, would not be considered an abuse of discretion because it is because the benefit that the that the parties are both getting would not be inequitable. So who determines the benefit and is there a financial? Uh, because I think the last time that we looked at this, it was like a, around a half million dollars of, of time that was given. So who determines whether it's beneficial and who determines whether it's a violation of the gift clause? It, it, I, I appreciate what you're saying. It just seems it's like there's no standard. So in the absence of the standard, who's going to decide what the standard is? So I can I can respond to the issue of who who would make a determination as to whether it would violate the gift, gift clause, and that would be a, a the the court would make a determination as to whether we violated the gifts clause. But if you're looking at the the decisions that have come down from the court, if you're looking particularly, um, particularly at the Chatham decision, uh, it what we're doing does not is not the same as what was happening in this court, but in the fact pattern with the court. And so I don't think that just looking at it from a legal perspective and how the court might review our idea of reassigned time, I don't think that it that the fact pattern is similar enough that it would get into the that it would get into a discussion of whether there was a clear abuse of discretion. <laughs> Okay, but we did not. Say oh, go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. I just wanted to, to ask a follow up question to Miss Flores to, to make it clear. I, I think Miss Wynn asked, "Who uh, is there a policy in place and uh, under our system? Um, and is it in fact the college president that makes that uh, ultimate decision on what the value is and how to place that value?" Um, I would, I would say that, and, and I haven't been asked to, uh, to a I, I, I have been asked to a on this, um, within the organization itself, because I've only been serving in this capacity for a, you know, a number of weeks, but I will say that in my capacity as, as, um, as a general counsel and in other institutions, yes, that would be an administrative decision. And then if there was a concern that there might be some sort of proportionate um, benefit, then that would go to the office of general counsel and the office of general counsel would look to see what the benefit is, what the case law says, um, what, you know, what other, what other courts have decided with respect to gifts clause and then present a, a legal opinion. Okay. Thank you. I think a lot of work has gone into this document. And so what I'm hearing is that we haven't sent this out for an independent review of this particular part of this document, even though we know that this is an, a source of contention in the past. So that primarily the, the majority of the document we may have some issues with, but, but the, I think the majority of this document we agree on. And yet we still have a concern about this, this and we haven't sent it out for an independent review of this um, to get an independent determination. We're, we're assuming that we're okay, but we don't know for sure that we are. Is that fair? Uh, I would say that, and a lot of this also goes to, um, to the practice of sending things out for an independent review. In well, there, while well, general counsel is certainly able to do that, um, I, I think that the internal review of the law and an, in, an internal determination can be sufficient, um, of course, unless the general counsel has been asked to send it out. I mean, then that would be, then they would do that. But I think the internal review is sufficient because we know we're, look, we're looking specifically or the, the general counsel's office look, is looking specifically at um, whether there is a disproportionate benefit. and. 
so I, it doesn't necessarily, I don't think that our, my position or our position in the general counsel's office would necessarily be, um, be different if we, if we send it out for review, because we would be having to internally defend this externally if it's brought up, right? So we would have to defend it externally. And if it was, if it was brought to court and we currently don't have any, we don't have any concern about this particular position about reassigned time. Okay, I think there was a request by Mrs. McGrath to have it independently reviewed and I could be again wrong about that, but I thought she requested that the last time, the last time we saw this document and I don't want to speak for Mrs. McGrath, but I do believe there was a request for an independent review. I, I, However, I don't, I, I don't remember the request. Yeah, one board member's request is not a request from the. Understood. Understood. Thank you, Dr. Thor. Okay, so is there any more discussion? Okay, I've got. Uh, Mrs. Sullivan can can hear the discussion. She can't. She just can't speak. So we'll have the vote, and I'll call her and get her on on the mic to see if we can get her vote uh, as well. If that's okay with everybody. So, if there's no more discussion, we'll take the vote. Uh, Ms. Bittersmith. Aye. Ms. McGrath. Mr. McGrath. Can you hear me now? There you are. Um, I'd like to explain my vote. Okay. I'm very disappointed that when we request an independent review, that it does not go to the attorney general or perhaps to the county attorney. To ask for an independent review does not mean that our employees review this for us. And I think that uh, uh, that was a, a it's a major disappointment to me that uh, we fall back on the uh, premise that only one person can make this request. I vote no. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Smith? Aye. Uh, Dr. Thor? Aye. Mrs. Wynn? I'd like to explain my vote. Um, I know that a lot of work went into this document. I think it's a, it's an important document and um, I am concerned <laughs> that there are parts of this, ag this agreement that will be challenged legally. And I wish that we had, we, it doesn't go into effect, I think till June or July 1st. And I wish that we would uh, give ourselves, we, we allowed the, the fact team to take a lot of extra time with this document I think the time frame in which we are reviewing it is is much shorter, and I I think we as a governing board are being irresponsible by voting for it, it with such a shortened amount of time. And I realize what Dr. Peterson said October, but but the board we only have two of our board members that are brand new, and they weren't here in October, so I I think that we're in February and it's less than three months. So I think we might statutorily have an issue too because the board changed. So I have concerns and because of those concerns, not because I don't appreciate the work of the fact team, I'm going to vote no. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Sullivan, are you on? I, I got a text from her. I was hoping that she would be on. Um, I think I'm on. There Am you are, I you on? are on. Yes, you are. Oh my gosh, I feel like I've been to the North Pole and back. Okay, um, and I was able to hear a lot of the discussion. I know you're asking for my vote right now. Uh, and I also heard a lot of the um, questions and appreciate everyone's effort to answer them succinctly and thoroughly. With that, I want to acknowledge the hard work of the team. I do believe legal review has been uh, not just sufficient, but has done, been done multiple times. So I vote aye in support of the agreement. And I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> You're welcome. And the student advisory vote, uh, Ms. Munoz. 
Mr. Narini, you haven't voted yet. Okay. Uh, well, I, I thought we'd get the student vote first. You can. Okay. Is Ms. Munoz? I vote aye. Oh, okay, thank you. And I vote, vote aye. And I, I want to thank the, the faculty and all the fact team for all the hard work that they've done to, to put this together. Uh, so I vote aye. So that's 5 2 in favor of accepting the uh, fact. And now I'll turn it back to uh, Mrs. Sullivan. I appreciate you doing that uh, to, to turn it back over to me, but I don't know about the reliability of this connection that took me quite a while. So um, I will do my best, but thank you very much, Dr. Narini, for stepping in when necessary. Also, again, uh, with the 5 2 vote, we move forward with this agreement and I, I want to acknowledge everyone's hard work and dedication to making this move for our employees in the district and helping us move forward again in, in new and better ways for everyone. With that, I'm going to take us to the uh, first read employment and information items, the employment and separations, December 26, 2020 through January 22, 2021. Any uh, comments? Being none, moving to the monitoring for I just, I just got myself unmuted. I do have a comment on this. Okay. Okay. Sorry, Jean, I was trying to move up too fast. I apologize. Uh, no, Please you were. I wasn't rest. fast enough with the button here. Um, I asked for a more definitive explanation of these people that are leaving our employee, and it didn't change. They're either retirement or voluntary. I have a feeling that quite a few of those, maybe not, maybe not quite a few, but some of them are not voluntary. I think we fire some people and I would like that delineated. For instance, they had our uh, in-house attorney down as voluntary. As I understand it, her resignation was not voluntary, it was forced. So I would like a better definition each month of whether the person retired whether they voluntarily left our employee or whether they were fired. And I would appreciate that very much in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I believe you did raise that before and I understood we would be moving forward with that. Um, it's not our place to discuss any other personnel actions or activity. And Ms. Sullivan, we lost you again. Dr. Narini, would you oh. mind um, finishing up the meeting? Okay. Uh, so let's see. Any so, uh, is there any more comments on the on that item? So moving on to uh, monitoring reports. Are there any questions or comments on the monitoring reports? Hearing none, we'll go to uh, community linkage, uh, the governor, governing board report. Uh, Mrs. McGrath. Mrs. McGrath, do you have a, a report? I have no report, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Smith. I have no report this evening, thank you. Okay, oh, Ms. Bittersmith, I'm sorry, I jumped right over you. No worries, Dr. Narini. Uh, just two brief things. I had a communication from citizens who are involved in the Scottsdale Community College Community Garden Program that also involves our students there. They were concerned about um, what was potentially happening with their utilization of facilities. Uh, that, that has been resolved, as I understand it, so I appreciate the SCC team reaching out and dealing with those community members who were most complimentary, by the way, about our students at SCC and how they interact in, in that program. Um, and I also had the opportunity to, along with um, board member Smith, uh, meet with Dr. Crow and his team just to talk about how um, ASU and the community college officer could interact in a positive way. And that is my report. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, Dr. Thor. Uh, no report, thank you. Uh, Ms. Wynn. I just wanna say, um, Thank you to the veterans group that presented tonight. I've had the uh, privilege of, of going to their events and being uh, with them. And we have a huge, uh, I think we still have the largest population of veterans in the K 
County and uh, even more than ASU. So uh, I think it's important that we continue to encourage uh, veteran students. Uh, employers prefer to have veteran students and I think that that would be a great way for us to increase our enrollment. Um, I also wanted to say uh, a big shout out to our local law enforcement on all of our campuses with the increased testing and vaccinations. Um, they have been doing extra duty. Uh, a lot of us aren't on campus, but they are. And uh, I really appreciate uh, the security they continue to provide to our campuses. And uh, so that is it. Thank you. Thank you. And let's see, is Ms. Sullivan back on yet? I don't see her. No, I I'm, don't either. I, I'm going to uh, suggest that she had a great month and uh, she had no report. Uh, and my my report, I don't have much of a report. I was just excited to get uh, the, the Phoenix College annual report and especially the part about the Phoenix College Preparatory Academy and the 44% of those students who uh, received their associate's degree. Uh, and I know that was in, in large part with with all of the dual enrollment and ACE program that they're that they're involved in, and just kind of excited and hope we can expand that to other high school students around the around the the county. Uh, so one more time, Ms. Sullivan, any report? Any back? No. Okay, our next meeting is set for March fourth, twenty twenty one, at five thirty p.m. as a work session. And then uh, we have another meeting on March 16th, 2021 uh, at 4.30 p.m. for agenda review. And March 23rd at 6.30 is our regular board meeting. Um, uh, the governing board of MCC will be assessing a monthly basis on the status of the in-person meeting. Uh, with that, I wish everybody a happy evening and a great week and the meeting will be adjourned. It is adjourned.